code for God's redemptive plan. God's, God's idea on how to rescue us. That's what Christmas is to me. God's plan. And that's, that's when the lightning bolt struck. That's not when, you know, God didn't wake up on, you know, in, at uh, 3 B.C. and say, hey, you know, why, why don't I send my son? What? God had been working for Christmas. So look here, Luke's chapter, chapter 2. And folks, I'm almost done. I, I, I appreciate just talking with you and talking to you some, instead of reading. Let's look at this story again. Luke 2, 1. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth under Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and the lineage of David. The prophet Micah had already prophesied that when the Messiah came, he was going to be born in Bethlehem. Well, that's just part of it. Thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though be smallest among the nations, out of thee shall he shall come he who shall redeem Israel. Do you see? <laughs> the emperor, listen to this, the emperor of Rome made a decision that made it necessary. For Joseph to go to Bethlehem. So that Jesus could be born in Bethlehem. God's working. God's planning for Christmas you find my spot here I'm sorry I lost my place look over at Luke chapter 3 Luke chapter 3 verse 31 <clears throat> Matthew gives the genealogy genealogy of Joseph. Luke gives the genealogy of Mary. Now, that's, that's radical in itself. Ladies, I love you, and, I, and you're what make the world sweet and pleasant, when sometimes it is not. But, but I hope that as you study, even when you study the Bible and you study history, I want you to understand how very little women mattered in ancient times. I, I know that there are still inequities and inequalities in, in our, even in our society today. But we know places in the world where women still don't matter and they don't count and they are still considered to be possessions. But that is rare in our world. To, to have a genealogy of a woman was... It's just, it's mind-boggling. But look here at Luke 3, verse 31. Let's just kind of jump in the middle of these begots here. Verse 31 says, Which was the son of Meliah, which was the son of Menon, which was the son of Matatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David, which was the son of Jesse, which was the son of Ovid, which was the son of, and it says in the King James Version, Booz, which is Boaz, which was the son of Salmon, which is the son of Nahasan. Now let me flip back. I think that's, that's all I'm going to hit tonight. Well, let's, let's go. Let's, let's finish up over in the, in the book of Ruth. Let's, let's at least turn to the book of Ruth tonight. It's right after Judges. You and I might think that it would be a simple thing to make sure 
that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And, and it's not just a geographical <coughs> choice. It has to do with millions of details working together in concert. All of my life I've had the opportunity to go to various concerts of different orchestras. And uh, have you ever, if you've been, have you ever been there at the first of a performance when you hear this awful racket coming from the orchestra that's going, and it just, man. I really didn't understand that until I, until I started learning how to play the violin. And, and uh, I, I probably knew or suspected it all along, but they're, they're tuning up. They're, they're getting in tune with each other. And when you, when you, there's a certain thing that you do on a violin to make sure that, that it's all, that the violin is in tune with itself. And it sounds like that's like a cat squall. God has been getting, it's his orchestra, and for centuries, oh, centuries, he was tuning and preparing, getting every piece of the orchestra into place. Here's, here's the story of the, of the book of Ruth. It's a story about an Israelite family. A woman named Naomi and her <coughs> husband Elimelech. Or a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi. They have two sons, Machalon and Kilon. Well, they live in Bethlehem. They live in Bethlehem. And uh, there's a terrible famine in the land. And it's awful. It, there are people starving and there's nothing to eat. In other words, there, there's so much nothing to eat that I'm not talking about there wasn't much to eat. They had to leave Bethlehem to find something to eat. And they went down to the land of Moab. Moabites are related to Jews, but not in a good way. One of the most terrible stories in the whole Bible accounts for the existence of the Moabites, and I'm not even going to mention that tonight. One of the most horrid, awful, triple X stories in the whole Bible accounts for the existence of the country of Moab. And they hate the Jews. And they're the ultimate enemies of the Jewish people. And that's where Elimelech and his wife and the two small boys, that's where Elimelech took them to find food. That is another reason to tell you how desperate things were. If you would go to Moab to find food, things are bad. They get there, they set up their life, they do find food. They're strangers in a strange, very strange land where the animosity would have been thick all the time. They would have been in the minority and they would have been mistreated and they would have been looked down upon in, in so many different ways as being Jews in Moab. But they did find some friendship, and they did find some people who, with whom they could have relationships. Because the boys grew up and they found there were Moabite women who married them. One of those girls who married one of those Hebrew boys was Ruth. She was a Moabite. Elimelech died. Both the sons died. Naomi is a widow, and her two daughters in law are widows. Naomi decides that she'll just go, she'll go back. She's heard there's food in Bethlehem again. She's going to go back home. She's going to go back home now. She's going back to Bethlehem. They've packed up everything and they're, they're getting out, of, they're leaving Moab. And when they get to the, to the country border, Naomi turns to the two girls and she says, you know, 
I've been thinking about this. There's, there's no reason in the world why you girls should believe your parents and your, your family and your country. They're, you know, this is ridiculous. I know you love me and we're a family. And you love my sons. But uh, you're just coming. I feel like you're just coming with me out of duty and obligation. And she says, I, I love you and I hate to see you go. But I'm, I'm releasing you. You can go back. And one of the daughter-in-laws wept. And she fell on Naomi's neck and kissed her and, and just cried, but she went back to her mom and dad. Ruth made one of the most profound statements in, in all the Old Testament from a human being. I hear it a lot at weddings. It's really not a wedding verse so much, but it really works for a wedding. She looked at Naomi, Ruth, this, this young girl, this young Moabite woman, and she said, Entreat me not to leave me, nor to return from following after thee. For your people shall be my people, and your God will be my God. She said, Don't, don't ask me to leave you. Don't ask me to leave you. I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you. She was going to find out what it was like to be treated with prejudice, and how it was like to be looked down upon and to treated to be treated. She was going, listen, God's people, the Jews, are some of the most arrogant people you will ever meet in your whole life. Let me tell you what, you go over to the Holy Land sometime. You go over to Israel. If, if someone, if one of the people that lives there in Israel comes up to you, and shakes your hand and smiles at you and pats you on the back and says, welcome to this country. And he's smiling at you and he's, he's just so happy you're there. That's Palestinian. He's Arabic in descent. If somebody walks by you and doesn't even look at you, and if he does look at you, he kind of has this look on his face like you stepped in something and you smell just exactly like what you stepped in, that's a Jew. Naomi and Ruth go back to Bethlehem. They still remember Naomi. When she gets to the city limits of Bethlehem, the ladies, all the women in Bethlehem, come out to greet her. They fall on her neck, they love her and hug her, and they cry with her. Naomi, we're so glad you're back home. She said, don't call me Naomi. Naomi means sweet. She says, don't call me Naomi. Let's look at that verse there. Look at chapter 1 of Ruth. Look at verse 20. Ruth 1 20. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. That means bitter. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. It started with a famine and I had to leave home. My husband died. And we went to a strange place. My husband died. My two sons died. And now I don't have anything. Don't call me sweetie anymore. I call everybody sweetie. I don't know. Women, I don't call men sweetie much. That, that, that hasn't worked out too well. Terry will say, don't call the waitress sweetie. 